some more pipes and we're going to start with the big ones. These big wooden ones, I think they're called flutes, they're pretty chunky. And they're actually the octave lower as the same length in the open diapason ones, these ones here. So let's have a closer look, shall we? So as the air runs up the pipe, it comes through this thin slit. The airflow then gets sliced by this bit of material, which makes a tiny bit of turbulence, which excites the air that's already inside the pipe. And this creates vibrations in the lengths that are called standing waves. And these standing waves tend to be predominantly the length between this point and the top of the pipe. This wooden flute pipe functions in the same way, and it creates a standing wave that is the length of the pipe. So it goes And you directly hear the frequency of that wave because it correlates to the pitch uh, that you hear in your ears. If you add more air and turbulence, you can end up doubling the length of the standing wave, which takes it up to the next octave. Oh, needs a lot of air. At some points, you'll notice that both of those waves are still there. Your brain tends to listen to the one that's most predominant. So at the start, it's the lower type, and if you push it harder, it's the higher one. <laughs> However, the air doesn't give a damn if the hole is at the top or the hole is at the bottom. So you can double the length of the pipe by literally putting your hand on the top of it, if I can reach. I'm gonna go and get a shorter one so I can actually reach the end of it. These wooden ones come with a piece that you bung in the top and this also acts as its tuning method because the further you get it in the higher the note becomes. So with the top of this you get a different tone from the wooden ones and you also get a lower note for how long your pipe is. So that means that these chunky mummers are going to be lower than this register right here. I think, I still don't know what I'm doing by the way. chest out and have a closer look at it, shall we? This wind chest is for the big mummers and it functions slightly differently to the other wind chests that we've looked at. Let's have a look on the inside, shall we? So you may remember when we pulled it out in Bristol, you saw these things with loads of pipes coming out of them. <laughs> Holy crap, we're not fitting that in the lot van. Oh my God. It's ginormous. Okay. That's, that's the biggest one there. This is the biggest one out of all of them. No dates on these things yet, but they are crazy little pipe things. Right, so that is coming out. You're coming with me. Cool. This is the electronic control for this rank right here. These are the electromagnetic valves and there were pipes that were coming out of them that when these were energized were sending air through the pipes. These pipes then traveled into these holes right here, which were underneath these right here. And as you can see, unfortunately, they're all a little bit broken. If these weren't broken, the air would inflate these and push these upwards. When the air blew into these, this pushed up and opened a hole right here. And this hole connects to the inside of these pushy bellows right here. When these inflated, the hole opened and the high pressure actually pushed these down to deflate. Obviously you can't see that yet, but we're gonna bung a GoPro in here and have a look in a second. What that does is it pushes this valve down, causing the air to rush through this hole and out into the organ pipes. Let's connect it up to some air and have a closer look. Right, let's see what we get. As we're pushing these up, the ones inside are going down, opening the hole for the air to rush through like crazy. So these on the inside, while some of them needing a little bit of adjustment, are all working. These on the other hand are absolutely mushed. So we've got two choices. Either A, we get this working, get a load of pipes coming out of here, and then replace and repair all of these. Or B, we dramatically simplify this whole thing by adding solenoids here instead of these little thingamajiggies right here. And for a bit of a spoiler, I'm pretty set on option B, which is replacing these with solenoids, which in essence simplifies the whole process. And it means if we do need to move the organ at any point in the future is still a heck of a lot easier because this is all in one box and it doesn't need to be connected to a whole other box with a whole other string of pipes and stuff. 
These things only need to move about five millimeters and there's hardly any loads. So that means we can use a solenoid near the end of its travel, which means we can drive it with much less voltage and current. You absolute beast, Sam, that's not how you do it. It's not like this was destined for the scrap heap or anything. No, 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 no. Oh, there's a couple of hanger on us. Let's just do it. Oh. Oh, poor things. Poor, poor things. These things were sat on the staircase for 50 years. These things have probably seen a vacuum cleaner or two. So yeah, they've definitely seen better days. This is the underside of it. These have all been removed. No springs are required because the pressure keeps these closed. You push these and the valve at the top, this is the bottom by the way, opens up. So we just need the solenoid to do this basically. Also check out the newspaper that was used as gaskets for these little valve thingamajiggies. I can't find any dates on them, but that's fascinating nevertheless. It's gonna work. It actually works. So now when I push a button on my test keyboard, it sends a signal over to the circuit board, same as last week. That then turns on this mechanism, which opens up the main valve to let the air into the pipe. Whew. Oh, that's booming. So I got these wired up just in time for people to play them at the museum. I had them hardwired to the lower octave of the other pipes here. So that meant when you played the lower octave, it would be basically three sets of pipes playing at the same time. And it sounds pretty crazy in this room. As you can hear, it's got a pretty weird and funky and boxy sound. So it isn't the usual atmosphere you hear at organ. So it sounds a bit different, which I'm all for because I'm up for a bit of funky. But anyway, for everybody that didn't come to the museum this weekend, this is what they sound like. If I'm being honest, I'm not sure how well these are going to translate to the audio that you're gonna hear in the video because these are very boomy and subby and most of the frequencies that come from these vibrate you instead of vibrate your ears. But let's give it a go anyway. play them underneath the rest of the pipes. But this isn't all 
for today. No, 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 we have this right here, which is a smoke machine, and this smoke machine is pointing into the entrance of the pump. You see, it came up in the comments quite a lot in the last couple of videos. Well, it had already been talked about. Chris, who helps out at the museum, brought this along. And he was the first person to mention that you should try and pop smoke through it and see what happens. So I figured, uh, let's give it a little go. Obviously, putting smoke through it is probably not the best thing to do. So we're only going to do it once or twice. And we probably won't do it when the museum's open because you've got to deactivate the fire alarms and all that stuff. But let's see what it does anyway. Right, let's give it a go. Oh no! It's coming through the cracks! Oh no! It's coming through the cracks! Oh yeah! <laughs> about 30 seconds. Well that took about 30 seconds to end up like this. I can imagine that might be cool for an outdoor organ. As you can see it took 20 seconds and it already looks like a nightclub. You won't even know what's coming out of what. <laughs>